with the two co-chairs. So I will give also the floor to Isaiah to say a few words. I Isaiah, over to you. Thank you very much. Valerie and I just wanted to say thank you dear colleagues for making the time to join this uh, event. This is an initiative um, that joins others that we do within the uh, task team on human rights engagement where we engage um, with practitioners and with policy makers on key questions related to human rights. Um, we really really look forward to the, to the discussions. Um, welcome once again. Over to you Valerie. Thank you so much, Isaiah. And over to Elisa, the second co-chair of the task team. Over to you. Elisa, is the connection OK? Oh. Sorry, OK. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Sorry. So everyone good evening good afternoon good morning um i was just mentioning to you that uh, i hope you enjoyed the webinar and if you have any question you, you can write in the chat box so that we will collect all the questions and make sure that then the panelists can respond thank you so much wonderful thank you elisa and isaiah Excellent. Actually, uh, some of you might have uh, participated in an event that the task team has conducted on 16th of September when we had three special procedures mandate holders and we discussed how we can practically use the special procedures in humanitarian work. And one of the concrete recommendations of this event was to have a separate dedicated discussion on individual complaints mechanisms. So this is why we are here, we listen to your recommendation. And we really hope that today you will not only learn new information, but also take away with you very concrete examples on how you can practically use it in your day-to-day -day work. And uh, we would be very happy uh, to hear from you afterwards how you have used it. Um, so that we are all comfortable in this event, you probably know the ground rules that uh, we have usually in place. So we will keep all participants on mute if you can uh, keep the mute button. Uh, if you are not speaking and um, we will receive the questions through chat. So we will be constantly monitoring the chat as Elisa mentioned. So please feel free uh, to drop any questions you may have, but any comment as well or um, idea that is related to the topic and we will get back to you uh, whenever there is a time slot allocated to it. Um, if you feel uh, comfortable, we are happy to do on camera. Uh, have more uh, nice environment uh, in this event, but we also understand if there are technical constraints to do so. Excellent. So I think we are ready to start and we are very fortunate uh, today because we have two distinguished guests uh, with us from the Office uh, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, Federica Donati, the unit coordinator of the Special Procedures Mandate Holders Branch and Sagnik Chattopadhyay, Human Rights Officer. So uh, we have really the experts on the topic um, that will be uh, presenting to us and sharing with us uh, various examples. And uh, we are aware that some of you have already submitted questions in the registration form. So I wanted just to reassure you that we have taken on board all your questions shared ahead of the event and we will address them as we go through the presentations and uh, throughout this event. So thank you very much. Without uh, um, any further delay, I would like to give the floor to Federica. Over to you, Federica, please. Yes. Uh, sorry, Federica, I think we don't hear you as of now. Sorry. <laughs> I need to move. 
Yeah, I was saying that Sagnik and myself are very happy to have this space to to talk to you a little bit about the communication procedure of the special procedures uh, uh, mechanism. It's, uh, as uh, Valerie and the other colleagues said, it's really a, a, an informal exchange because you bring a wealth of experience and expertise already, and it's good to, uh, to compare notes how we can really use this mechanism to the benefits of the of the duty bearer really i will start uh, uh sharing uh, a powerpoint presentation which i hope it works um and uh and maybe for those just so that we are on the same page you know for those who, who uh follow the previous webinar but for those who didn't follow just to uh to to locate to you where Human rights system. As uh, Valerie said, myself and Sagnik, we work for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that, that provides support and expertise to the UMAR, UN human rights uh, mechanisms. Um, there is a specific branch called the Special Procedures Branch, for example, which provides support to the thematic uh, special uh, uh, rapporteurs. And as you know, these mechanisms, they are of uh, two main types, right? There are the intergovernmental bodies that are based on the charter of the UN. And this is, for example, the Human Rights Council. I'm sure you have heard about the council. And then there are more the type, the independent expert bodies mechanism that there are the treaty bodies, for example, Human Rights Committee, Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, Committee on Discrimination on, um, on Discrimination Against Women. Uh, and these are based on the on the on the treaty on the instrument that uh, basically set them up uh, and the special procedures uh, which are independent uh, expert, um, independent individual expert or uh, working group that are subsidiary bodies of the U of the Human Rights Council because because they are created and appointed by the Human Rights Council. So as a result, by consequence of being subsidiary body of the Human Rights Council, they are also called charter-based bodies uh, because the council is based on the UN Charter. So this is just to locate you in one slide. And then maybe just to remind you, uh, because here we are, we are uh, uh, zeroing on special procedures mechanisms. So just to remind you the basics of this mechanism. Uh, these, as I said, are independent expert, individual uh, uh, independent expert, or uh, we have a few that uh, are called working groups because in fact it's five individual experts that work together. Uh, on a thematic issues. Uh, uh, they monitor countries or thematic human rights issues. As you will see, there are uh, 55 uh, special procedures mandates, but mostly they are thematic, 44, and 11, only 11 are the, the country uh, ones. The country ones, they look at all the human rights situation in a, in a, in a given country. I heard a few countries, for example, there is one, for example, just to give you an example, on the Central African Republic, uh, the, uh, and there was one, for example, on, on Eritrea. I think some of you work on Eritrea. Um, whereas the thematic ones, they look at, uh, you know, at the whole world, but just uh, they zero in on one uh, thematic expert or one thematic area. It could be torture, food, right to food, right to water and sanitation, etc. Uh, they can do many things, this uh, special uh, procedures mechanism. Um, they have a mandate given to them by the Human Rights Council, as I mentioned. Um, what is, uh, what is uh, uh, you know, they can conduct country visit and present official country visit reports. Uh, they, they present many thematic reports uh, to the council where they, they develop uh, thematic uh, research and other, and other tools. Uh, what is of relevance to us today is that they receive uh, and consider direct complaints. So submissions of alleged human rights violations. So we are looking into that specific uh, stream of work of the special procedure. So what and we call it communication procedures. You know, this communication is a generic uh, term, a broad generic term. Uh, but what are these communication basically? These communication are just letters, letters that the special procedures mandate holder, uh, mostly jointly. So they they get together a few of them. They send to the government concern. 
and uh, and relate to alleged human rights violation, or they could be also relating to acts of intimidation and reprisal against those who cooperate or seek to cooperate or have cooperated with the UN in the field of human rights. So as I said, these are just letters uh, sent to the uh, normally to the relevant governments. We call them, they are called in three different different ways, but this is mainly a functional distinction. And uh, I think, uh, you know, for external uh, purposes is not that relevant, but uh, there are the urgent appeals that are really on a, uh, on a alleged violation that is ongoing. Uh, and is very is a is a um, there is a, de a gender a danger to life. It's a life-threatening situation that is imminent. For example, we use a lot of urgent appeals for uh, executions, uh, for forced eviction, etc. So really, there there is a time-sensitive nature in the urgent appeal, and usually is to ask the government to stop to hold the uh, the violations. The allegation letters are those that relate to more to uh, alleged violation that occurred already. Uh, so is after uh, they have occurred. So what we obviously ask the government is more to investigate, to bring the perpetrator to justice, to provide remedies to the victims, and obviously to take measure to prevent the reoccurrence of this uh, alleged violation we call other letters and then there is another group that is called other letters these are those letters because the rapporteurs can receive the, um, information on alleged violation we will see it later uh, of individuals and group but also they can receive information when uh, a legislation or a policy for example is not compliant with international human rights norm and standards. So these are, uh, we call them, as I said, functionally other letters. Uh, and it's basically to, uh, to, to, uh, to inform the government that there are concerns about a particular legislation or policies. The main purpose of this communication or letter is really to obtain clarification uh, and to really say, you know, we have received this information. What else can you tell us about this? And what are you basically basically uh, doing. This is not a determination of whether a violation has occurred or not. There isn't such a determination. It's more, the, the, the purpose is more to engage in a dialogue with the government on the particular case and situation. So as I kept on mentioning, the government obviously, uh, uh, you know, the the duty bearers are mostly government. So then most most of these letters are sent to government, but they are also sent to international organization. On state actors, including businesses, sometimes they are sent to the UN because this uh, uh, special procedures mandate orders are independent even from the UN. As you know, they are not paid. They just have a UN mandate, but they remain independent from anyone. Uh, who can submit complaints? Uh, the victims, uh, their representatives, that could be the families, the lawyers, an organization, and NGOs. Everyone can basically submit uh, information on alleged violations. Um, um, the sources are always kept confidential. Special procedures never disclose uh, their sources, and this is is a is a principle very dear to the special procedures. Um, uh, way of working and uh, working modalities. The communication, as I mentioned briefly, can concern an individual or more than an individual, a group, a community, but they can also concern legislation, uh, policies uh, uh, that are not compliant or they're allegedly not compliant with uh, international human rights norm and standards. There are, because these procedures, I mean, you probably see it, uh, you know, when we get to the end, um, is, uh, is quite flexible. There are very few admissibility criteria, uh, which are, I have listed it here and uh, you can see it. One may be mo very important thing to bear in mind also is that the special procedures, they cannot act only on the basis of media reports. Uh, as uh, you see the last, uh, the last point, this is, uh, this is very important. So the submission uh, is absolutely key, as well as obviously when we when the special procedures. I'm not going into it, but when special procedure receive a communication, they also um, sorry a submission. They they also try to corroborate through other sources, through our uh, colleagues in the field. To
some of you maybe uh, you may have received the request already, uh, but we can discuss later. Now, what uh, what also you have to bear in mind that is very important is that these procedures is co remains confidential for a while, huh? but only for a while. So for a maximum period of 60 days, the 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 the, the, the procedure remains confidential, meaning it's an exchange of letters uh, between the rapporteur and the uh, government or the other addresses. Uh, so, uh, but then f uh, following after these 60 days periods, we publish the letters that are sent to the government as well as the replies that they may have uh, uh, been received in the in the meantime and these letters um, are publicly available in a link that we will also show later uh, which is a sort of a is a searchable site where you can see for example for your the country where you work or you know the thematic area that you are covering you can see all the communications that uh, were sent and a reply received. The only exception to this period of 60 day of confidentiality period is basically this letter that I, I mentioned to you are called other letter uh, and are the ones legislation and policies. These are usually uh, made public 48 hours after they are sent to the government. And this is, why, why is that? First of all, because there are no individual concerned. So is, we are not talking about an individual or a group of, of a, or, a, or a case of a groups of individuals. Uh, and usually because what happens is that these uh, letters are uh, relate to uh, legislation that is in, uh, in the making, that is being discussed discussed in parliament so there is a a, a debate in the, at the country level right about this legislation or policy so it's important that, that the analysis of the special rapporteur on the whether the legislation complies or not with international human rights standard is available uh, you know, while the debate is uh, is ongoing and not maybe 60 days after when the debate probably is over because Parliament has uh, adopted or the, the whole procedure has moved forward. Um, so the, the and uh, other than in this site, these communications sent and the replies received are also made publicly available in what we call communication report. This is a, uh, this is a report that is presented three times a year to the Human Rights Council. As you know, there are three sessions of the Council per year. So every at every session, we uh, basically submit a communication report, which is the compilation of the communications sent by the rapporteurs and the replies received um, in a certain period of time. Uh, uh, what about feedback, right? Because you say you are, uh, you submit an information and then because, and you say, so what happens? How do I know? Because, you know, there is this confidentiality period. So th that, yeah, that's that's a bit of a, of an issue in a sense that if, uh, that we cannot, uh, and the rapporteurs cannot really tell you much during this confidentiality period, even if you are the source of information, if you have submitted the information. Uh, I, the, the rapporteurs can tell you if action has been taken. So, you know, and uh, sometimes there also, there are a bit of a back and forth, you know, between uh, us uh, on behalf of the special rapporteurs and the sources, because maybe there are some details that are missing, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so the, what we can tell you is if action has been taken, but we cannot give you a copy of the letter. We cannot, you know, provide you more information in that confidentiality period. So what we will tell you is please keep on checking the this site for when the text of the actual letter will be uh, publicly uh, available. So I know this is a bit first. I mean, we understand it's, this is a bit frustrating for the sources who would like to know uh, more, particularly if action has been taken, because we know that the sources need uh, that also for their advocacy work on the ground. But is uh, uh, we are trying to preserve, as I said, this confidentiality period, which is not not there for nothing. It's really to try and get, and have this dialogue so that the government takes uh, steps and measure to uh, redress the the violation. Um, 
So just uh, uh, what is very important, and I I I, I left it uh, for for this slide only, is also to remember uh, that we that the special procedures also take very seriously the do no harm principle, so the protection concern that they may be around the victims. So that's why we also ask for consent. So in the uh, you know when you when you when someone sends information about an alleged violation that we always want to make sure that there is consent and this consent is informed consent informed what does it mean uh, what does it comprise this informed consent first of all that the victim consent to have the case taken up by a UN mechanism the special procedures mechanism because the name of the victim will be in the letters that is sent to the government, this confidential letter that is sent to the government, right? So that's that has to be made very clear to the victim and they have to consent. Then what we ask is also whether the victim consent to have the name uh, available, uh, publicly available in the um, in the verse in the communication that will be, be made publicly available 60 days after uh, it is sent. This is not compulsory. If there are protection concerns, we don't make uh, the names public in the in the communication that will be available on the site. So we 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 redact names and details that may identify the victims, and we do that already by default in certain cases. If, for example, the victim is a child, is a child. Uh, if there are issues of sexual violence, uh, gender-based violence, etc. We do it by uh, by default. In all other cases, we need uh, the consent of the victim to have or not the name uh, available in the in the communication that will be made public. And this is, as I said, is because this is a, a, a way to preserve the do no harm principle. Because as you know, special procedures they don't really have the uh, means to uh, to provide any physical protection to the victim, right? Uh, on on the ground. So uh, we need to. Uh, I mean, it has to be clear that uh, uh, that's why we we are really um, insisting on on consent. And there have been cases where we didn't. Uh, we couldn't take um, send any communication because it was too risky for the victim to have even the names put in the included in the letter to the government. Just for you to flag a few things, one is that we have a working group on enforced and uh, involuntary disappearances uh, and a working group on arbitrary detention that have a slightly different uh, communication procedures because they are very, for historical reasons, these are very old mandates starting in the 80s and uh, so for the and the working group on enforced and involuntary disappearance has also a bit of a humanitarian mandate so which is very close to what uh, the work you do uh, so and the working group on arbitrary detentions makes determination on whether a detention has been arbitrary so, so because of this specificity that they have a slight they have also their own slightly different communication procedures we are not going to go into the details today but obviously we remain available through Valerie or directly to uh, to give you more information on this uh, on these two working groups uh, and just please bear in mind which as I said this is not a ju judicial or quasi judicial complaint mechanism as I said there's no determination on whether a violation has actually occurred uh, um, but on the other hand, ratification of a treaty is not necessary. So, you know, from any country, any anyone can submit information on any thematic issue. There's no need for exhaustion of domestic remedies. So if you know, the source feels that even if there is a, a, a proceeding going on at the domestic level that uh, they want to alert also the international level, that is absolutely possible. Um, and also, you know, the, the, the independence of the mandate is also key, obviously, to keep this uh, procedure very agile, because I hope that I was able to, to, to demonstrate it is a rather flexible uh, and agile uh, procedures, including if you compare it with other UN human rights mechanism available. Um, now, clearly, uh, there are also limitation, and one limitation, as I said, because it's agile, because it's flexible, there are very little, uh, very few admissibility criteria. 
you know, basically many submissions are actually somehow admissible and, uh, you know, could be acted upon, but uh, obviously not, is uh, the special procedures cannot take action on every single complaints or submission that they receive. So, you know, basically whether an expert decides to take up or not a complaint is at his or her own discretion. And, uh, you know, they, they, they usually, uh, you know, work out certain strategy, a certain strategy around communications because they want to uh, maybe take up more cases from a certain regions, or maybe they they want to take uh, more cases from uh, um, you know that relate to a specific thematic aspects of their of their of their mandate, etc. So the idea they they usually work out they want to take up um, emblematic cases uh, because you know just illustrative of a of a pattern in a particular country so they usually try to work out strategy on how to use the communication procedures because they're very well aware that for a number of reasons they cannot take action or send communication on every single submission and case that is brought to their attention i including here some statistics uh, um, voila i'm not gonna go through it also they are a bit uh, uh, old 2019 i mean of, uh, hopefully by the end of this year we'll have the 2020 uh, the 2020 statistics. Uh, so, and here is basically my last slide, which is uh, uh, on uh, um, useful links that I think uh, uh, will get us to the next phase that SAGNIC will uh, will take over. Is that right? Yeah. I'm not seeing anyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Federica, for this very succinct uh, summary, very useful one. And I want to reassure all participants that we will share the presentation afterwards with all the links and you will have access to it. I would like to encourage colleagues also to keep posting questions if you have in the chat box. And at the meantime, I give the floor to uh, Sagni for uh, the continuation of, uh, of uh, the presentation. Over to you, Sagni, please. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thanks for inviting in this session this morning. Um, I will uh, start with responding the questions that we have already received. And in that regard, we'll take you through the links that um, Federica mentioned. Uh, I'm just trying to present my screen here. Uh, sorry. Perhaps. Uh, hello. <coughs> Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Actually, we received a question that said that asked, what experiences tell us about the efficiency of complaint mechanism of the special procedures? Now, uh, it, uh, as uh, Federica was explaining, it is not surprising that the states and their elected uh, representatives make efforts to respect and comply with the requests made by these independent experts. Uh, in this, uh, in, this is a special procedure, uh, so OHCHR website, and I will show you how to go to the special procedure. It's under here under human rights body, bodies. If you click on the special procedures under this side, we have the mandate holders, the work of special procedures, and here is a link to the submitting complaints to the special procedures. It, talk, it has got three links. The first one talks about the communication procedure, uh, the, the details that uh, Federica already shared with you, what, the, what are the communications, what are the purposes, what do communications address, and all these details. And then here is the portal, the link to the portal through which you can make the submissions. Uh, well, and this can be done in the three languages. Here it is in English, uh, in French and Spanish. Uh, basically, it is uh, for, for now, uh, these are the only three languages in which we have the internal capacity to, to digest the submissions and also uh, prepare them for the mandate holders to send the letters. 
um, and uh, we were we were and, and actually these submissions they they are uh, confidential they are secure there is no way I and mean, we have ensured that there is no way to breach the confidentiality or the submission system and uh, supposing if someone starts making a submission through any of these links the information that we have um, posted in it will remain uh, available for uh, 48 hours after which it will be automatically deleted so at the, at the start of the submission you will be provided with a uh, username and an identifier so every time you can come back i mean you can come you can come back as many times as you want but there is there are there are the criteria that uh, of the questions that you have to answer clearly giving us as much as information as possible as necessary uh, for the submissions to be then processed inside by the by the staff uh, for for sharing with the mandate holders so this is the the, the um, portal through which anybody uh, anywhere in the world can uh, can uh, with an internet access obviously can make a submission directly and this is much more secure much more confidential and uh, and as much more agile in that sense otherwise people can send by email by letter also but that is um, that is actually well that's what it is i mean we cannot do anything uh, uh, better than that uh, for the moment uh, and but anyway we, we accept those letters also other than that as federica mentioned on the on the communication side here is a link to the search communications uh, for, for uh, to search the communications that have been sent and replies received from, from the government after 60 days in this regard uh, you would see this is the portal that uh, this is a, uh, the micro site the reporting site where you can search for communications it is in in in, in three parts the first is a basically a searchable and uh, database which gives access to uh, all kinds of uh, search possibilities that is um, you can search through through the, the session of the council to which a uh, committee which a, the report has been submitted whether the reply was received by which mandate you can filter by mandate by states by regions and by any search term say by refugees by refoulement by uh, arbitrary detention anything and uh, for now we have communications that are searchable as of from 1st of december 20, uh, 2010 uh, and uh, we are making efforts to get communications before that period also available through the database but that is going to take time as it is as it is quite a quite a old uh, period anyway the last one that i would like to show you is basically uh, as i was saying how the 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 communications make a difference now uh, if you go back to this page sorry okay let me go directly here here uh, for the uh, under the special procedures we have a link here where we are posting collecting good practices and stories of of successes following interventions by special procedures uh, under this title making a difference um, whereby mm, a good collection of stories have been already posted for example i mean this take, talks definitely about the efficiency of the system about the about the contribution they make to the better understanding of the situations and provide solutions that consolidate humanite awareness and standards of actions in this regard um, but we we understand all that no country is perfect in implementation of human rights standards and therefore uh, mandate holders they make recommendations on a diverse range of issues to all countries uh, with the with the sole intent of protecting human rights of all and for all now i will just uh, highlight three cases i mean this can you can find it from here on 7th of october the special uh, procedure experts praised canada for repatriating a 5 year old orphan from from syria camp uh, and um, this actually was requested by the reporters to canada, to canada 
and uh, <coughs> which the government really took note of and they obliged. Uh, then in another example, a court in Malawi took action based on communication procedures uh, of the of the uh, communications of the special procedures uh, by which uh, a communication was sent by the reporters on violence against women and the working group on discrimination against women and girls uh, concerning uh, alleged sexual assault by police officers in Lilongwe, Malawal, in Lilongwe. And following the letter, a high court judge delivered a judgment that found the police actions in violation of human rights law and ordered arrest perpetrators within 14, 14 days and that the applicants be compensated for their torture and violation of rights. Similarly, I mean, there are lots of such ex examples uh, you, will, you will find all throughout uh, throughout this um, uh, this uh, this particular link, and you can go through them under different um, these headings like legislative reforms that has happened, policy reforms, contributions to government uh, and judicial processes, raising human rights awareness. All of these basically they are an effort of special procedures operations as a whole, but many of them come also from the communication systems. Uh, if I can, if you allow me, I will just also quickly take up another question that we had received earlier, is that which asks that how can we engage human rights mechanisms to protect refugees where asylum governments infringe rights and ensure that hostile governments do not retaliate by shrinking the humanitarian space. Now, this is indeed a challenge as Frederica said, to provide physical safety and security to refugees, unless governments comply with human rights. Um, in this regard, as she mentioned, that it is also important to select cases that assure the do no harm principle. And therefore, it's very, very important to receive proper consent from the victims. That is, as she explained, consent to disclose the name to the authorities, because that's, that is also uh, needed. Uh, otherwise, uh, we do not we may not have a meaningful dialogue with the government and also uh, to, uh, but that's optional as you mentioned, to have the names disclosed public reports as well as, as you saw from the from the communication and uh, uh, reporting site that these communications are reported in the in the website and but we can protect the names if the if the victims they say that they do not want their names to be shared in the public report. We can protect the names. And by default, as she mentioned also, the children names and uh, name of some particular victims are by, by default um, protected. But we have to be very clear uh, in, in getting this consent uh, from the victims while uh, while processing the informations or submitting the informations for making us, uh, for making the communications, requesting for the communications. Now, uh, special procedures, have been consistent in, in, in intervening in cases of refugee refoulement, deportation of asyl asylum seekers, um, uh, secret detentions, especially in life threatening situations, as well as on separation of children from their parents, people escaping religious persecutions, and many situations across the world. I mean, communications in this regards have been sent to many countries. Uh, for example, we have sent them to Sweden, US, Denmark, South Korea, India, Uzbekistan, Cyprus, Italy, and everyone. The experts have also intervened in cases of negative stereotyping of refugees and migrants on alleged acts of discrimination, violence, detention in processing centers. Uh, raising, we raise, I mean, they raise their concerns on negative stigmatizations and rhetoric towards refugees and migrants including xenophobic attacks. Uh, unfortunately, governments, they do ret retaliate. And they had been, uh, you know, and, but through the communications, they are actually required to respond also, re respond to this, uh, to, to their actions. And that's where it, it kind of uh, gives them a sort of uh, responsibility to also submit a reply which would be under the global scrutiny, where people would be all looking at, at as to what, what has been the defense of the government for these kinds of interventions. 
and therefore they are they they, they think think uh, uh, twice also i mean because after all when they become aware that these these situations uh, of violations are under the scrutiny of these independent experts and there is a possibility of asking follow up follow up questions following up on these issues definitely it makes these governments not only aware of the plights if they were not aware before but also cautious about these violations and when it may not guarantee the physical safety but can stop ongoing valuation uh, violations and uh, make the these these perpetrators cautious also uh, from repeating the harms uh, but it, it you need to keep in mind that the mechanisms are dependent on the national authorities to protect and prevent uh, on the human right violations i think i'm i will stop here i will stop um, valerie and uh, uh, i will give back short back to you thank you so much sagnik and federica for the presentation and the useful elements shared and also responding to some of the questions and uh, I would suggest that we give back to you uh, several questions we received through the chat and also adding some of the questions received ahead of this event. So we can start with this first round of questions and at the meantime colleagues can think about other questions and we will then go back through a second round of uh, questions. So uh, taking up uh, received so far, um, one of the questions to you, to uh, OHCHR, OHCHR, is what if the thematic mandates overlap or um, it involves several uh, violations, the violation involves several mandates, what is uh, the process, how does it work, do the special procedures collaborate, uh, etc. So this would be area of question. The second one is, um, question whether special procedures collaborate with uh, other mechanisms such as for example treaty bodies and UPR what are um, their synergies to have a joint strategy to address and tackle an issue if uh, there is a communication between the mechanisms and ahead of the session we also received a question asking uh, what is the difference or comparative advantage of use of the individual complaints procedures of special procedures instead of other complaints mechanisms so what is the difference and uh, in which case to use which one third question is uh, of course when uh, let's say in UNHCR case uh, persons of concern to UNHCR refugees, internal displaced persons, stateless persons, asylum seekers take up an issue uh, to special procedures, there is certain expectations that there will be an action. So do you have any guidance or uh, is there any uh, example how to manage those uh, expectations if for example an agency is guiding this individual throughout the process a fourth question is um, to which i think you have uh, already responded uh, partially or uh, fully when communications does the center remain anonymous so can we ensure the uh, anonymous aspect uh, in certain cases and finally i would like to uh, take up a question that uh, we received ahead of this event there were actually several uh, ones that uh, were asking more concretely to unhcr what UNHCR has done in the past, how we have used this mechanism, uh, what are some of the concrete examples. So for this, I would like to ask my colleague Peter to give the UNHCR perspective to respond to UNHCR colleagues uh, on this call. Very good. So uh, maybe actually because for Peter it's just one question, I will start with Peter and then go to Federica and Sagnik if OK for you. Excellent. So over to you, Peter, please. Uh, thanks, Valerie. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to share a couple examples of, of how UNHCR has used the, the special procedures communication process. Um, 
general talking generalities because we engage with with these mandates on a confidential basis providing information and supporting the work they were doing one is a more traditional type of engagement with the procedure where we saw um, uh, asylum seekers and migrants crossing into Europe and uh, we were seeing a lot of uh, violations of human rights and human rights abuses at borders and entry points uh, and we had in this in one of our operations tried through the representative's office through the UNCT to to raise this issue with the government and we'd received no replies um, so there was a need to elevate the, the issue and one of the things that the representative did was in contact with the special procedures and one of the mandate holders. Uh, we provided information on the ground uh, related to the situation and a communication was sent, an official letter was sent by the, the, the special rapporteur to the government requesting information on the situation. Of course, the, the government came back uh, and replied to that communication. They, they denied human rights violations, but we were able to get an official response to the government on this on the record and into the public domain and this provided a lot of support for the advocacy that the UNHCR and the UNCT were doing to try and improve the situation on the ground. So even though it didn't receive necessarily the exact uh, response we wanted from the government, it did bring the issue to light and was then able to support the work we were doing. Uh, so that's one example. Um, <clears throat> another example moving to another part of the world um, is a case of an individual who is uh, an activist, a public activist, and also a religious figure. And this individual had <clears throat> fled this country of origin after facing death threats and other um, risks of arrest for, for blasphemy and other, other potential crimes, uh, and had fled into another country. However, in this, in this other country, they did not have necessarily a guarantee that the government would provide them with protection under, for example, refugee legislation. Uh, so one of the things they did was reach out to the special procedures branch who then in contact with UNHCR was able to verify some of the circumstances around this individual's case. And as uh, Federica mentioned, one of the principles is do no harm. So one of the things that was done was proceeding through an official communication process and an official letter. Alternate channels were figured out to, to respond to this individual case and to see what other possible solutions could be available keeping that option of a letter to the to the government available, but then working with other partners, UNHCR, uh, some states, some permanent missions to arrange and see what solutions could be found for this individual so that they wouldn't be put at risk, either through a public communication uh, or uh, in the event that they, they were returned. So those are just two examples. Um, we have more, we have a good practice guide for UNHCR colleagues of some of the examples of where UNHCR is engaged with special procedures generally, not just on communications. So uh, if you're UNHCR staff, you can reach out to us for that. I can give you some inspiration in ways we've used it in the past. Um, and we also have a guide uh, which I can put in the chat shortly, which looks not just at, at, at special procedures communications, but also uh, at the communications of uh, the, the treaty bodies as well also as a, as a tool and resource for, for you. It links to many of the resources that, that Sagnik and uh, Donata, um, sorry, excuse me, Frederica have uh, also mentioned here today. So let me just share that on the screen momentarily. It's not popping up. Anyways, I, it's not popping up on the screen, but I will put it in the chat. It's just a UNHCR resource uh, that, that collects a lot of the information that was presented. So uh, I think those two examples are, are emblematic of the way UNHCR has been engaging on, on different ways through the communications and I turn back to Valerie for the other uh, questions. Thank you, Peter. If you can stay uh, online because when you were presenting, we received an additional question uh, asking if the Human Rights Liaison Unit uh, is available to guide UNHCR colleagues to uh, towards which special reporters mandate to go when they are human rights violations. So if uh, this is a function that the Human Rights Liaison Unit can assist with, over to you. Absolutely. We receive lots of requests from the fields on a regular basis about this, this procedure, how it can be used and also how we can facilitate the communications with the mandate holders uh, themselves and their teams. Uh, so we have and are currently working with, with many mandate holders on ongoing cases and, and helping to find solutions that are both useful for the individual, the, 
UNHCR's operation and, and the mandate as well. So we're, we're always on standby to provide that support as, as needed. OK, thank you, Peter, for responding to the questions of UNHCR colleagues. And I'm turning back to Sagning uh, and Federica to respond to the first uh, lot of questions, please. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, shall I shall I start, Sagnik? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, also for the great, uh, great questions and uh, uh, that uh, raises some important points. The first question I noted was the thematic overlap and uh, that involves several violations. Yes, absolutely. I mean, almost all of the uh, the submissions we receive uh, relate to alleged violations that are uh, that, that are violations of more than one human right. As you know, the interdependence of human rights is um, is is there, and so probably uh, you know that same case would fall into many many of the thematic mandates. But uh, I mean, I didn't mention it. Uh, I didn't prolong myself on this. But basically, as you will see in the statistic, 80% of plus of all the communications sent are actually gen sent jointly by uh, by two or more uh, thematic special procedures mandate because of the inter interdependence of all that a case will most probably relate to a human rights defender who has been arbitrarily detained, has been harassed, whose right to freedom of expression and freedom of assembly and association has been uh, violated. And there you have already, I already mentioned at least four and mandates that would join such a communication, which also, if I may add, I mean, I think that uh, the examples Peter uh, mentioned are, are great example of uh, you know the, the 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 type of collaboration that can be between uh, you know OHCHR which is uh, mandated to support the special procedures and uh, UNHCR and other and other agencies that are very operational on the ground um and it's great that uh, you know UNHCR has this human rights liaison unit can do, that also is very knowledgeable about how to use the international mechanism, the UN human rights mechanism. I though wouldn't worry much about uh, uh, you know what you know from an external point of view. I wouldn't worry much about to to figure it out which mandate that would fit best under because this is something. This is an assessment that we also do. You know, once we re we receive the alleged uh, um, this submission, we look at the case and then we make us an assessment, say this could be of relevance to one, two, three, four uh, thematic mandates or eventually a country mandate, because if there is a country mandate, the country mandate will also join, will be actually sort of in the lead, right? So I wouldn't worry too much unless you have a very, uh, you know, strategic, uh, uh, how do you say, rationale for not having a mandate joining a particular communication, then yes, then you may need to flag it to us. Let's say, you know, for strategic reason, this mandate should not be joining the communication on this case, whatever, you know, but it's better that other mandates take it up. In that case, we need to know it because this reason may not be up, uh, evident to us, you know, like, uh, not very close to the ground. But other than that, I think that you shouldn't worry too much. You submit if you use the online questionnaire, you can you can um, you can uh, choose more than one mandate, but that choice it doesn't might is not binding because as I said, we will do our own assessment. This is just so to, to complement what uh, what Peter said. Um, for the, Sorry, just yeah. to add one one point, I mean, on this uh, you know, issue of uh, online submission form, you would be allowed to uh, to add at a maximum of five mandates, which you think is very relevant to the to your case. That is, you can make your choice, but it may not. I mean, if we internally while assessing your case, we find that there is perhaps not uh, not the mandate you selected, but a different mandate would be actually be more relevant. We will make the changes assessments internally and we will invite the relevant mandates who would be most appropriate uh, for, for, for your submission. So as, as, as Federica said, don't worry about whether you have missed any mandate or whether you have selected the most appropriate mandate or not, but make sure you what you provide as the information is full, complete, and as in, as many, in all respects as possible. We will also internally do our verifications analysis, and if necessary, we'll come back to you for more questions uh, before we, we, we develop the uh, the final uh, letters from the mandate holders. Voila. Back to you. 
Thank you. The second one was uh, collaboration with other mechanisms. Okay. Yes, of course, we collaborate. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, uh, these are all uh, each has its own uh, characteristic distinction. UPR is a member state led uh, mechanism. It doesn't look into individual cases. So, uh, you know, what what uh, treaty bodies? Yes, they look in, into individual complaints, uh, uh, but they they have um, they have uh, set more rigid, uh, if you want, a uh, set of procedures, uh, which then would link also to the next question. What we uh, what we try to cooperate a lot is on the follow up of uh, of uh, recommendations because UPR because it's a, a led uh, state led process that ends up in uh, making a recommendation to the state that is uh, examined so they usually pick up on the recommendation made by special procedures whether this communication whether this recommendation have been made mostly have been made in country visits because that's where you find the, 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 the most comprehensive set of recommendations on a country. And obviously the UPR will automatically pick those recommendations and follow up in when they do the review of the of the state, right? Uh, but they could also pick up recommendations um, that come out of communication, not not communication on individual cases, but if there was a communication, for example, on a legislation, they could pick up that recommendation as well when they review the state, uh, they review the state. So in this sense, treaty bodies similarly, when they do the state review, uh, there is lots of uh, follow up on the, of, the, the, of the recommendation of special rapporteurs. Uh, sometimes there are, with the treaty body, we also try to collaborate in follow up, in, uh, in following up on certain individual cases. Uh, stand, we, we try also to collaborate uh, in ways that says, okay, but if you have a case is submitted to you and for your uh, set of criteria is not admissible, you can always redirect the source that submitted that information to you to the special procedures because probably for the special procedure, the same case may be admissible because the, the admissibility criteria, as I said, are uh, very few for, for special procedures where are more rigid for uh, complaints, for treaty body uh, complaints complaint procedure. And this links to the third question, you know, what is the added uh, value or the, the advantage, comparative advantage of the special procedures um, complaint uh, mechanism is exactly that is very agile and is very flexible. And as I said, you don't have, uh, you know, a treaty body, you would need your state to have ratified that particular treaty. You would need to demonstrate that the case has exhausted domestic remedies or why it couldn't exhaust domestic remedies. And there may be other admissibility criteria that you need to uh, fulfill. I don't, sorry, I don't have all the detail list, but uh, you know, so in in, in that sense, um, uh, it, it may be more rigid to, uh, uh, to move the case beyond the admissibility uh, phase. Uh, and, and, and as a result, and then it takes very long. And it, uh, I think it takes pretty long uh, to go through these uh, procedures with treaty bodies. At the end, the, the, uh, whereas at least if the communication is sent by a special procedures mandate holder, after 60 days you would have uh, the, 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 the letter that was sent publicly available. And then there's the agency, as Peter mentioned, the agency, the UN country team, the, organize, the NGOs on the ground can use it for their advocacy purposes. Even as Peter said, even if the reply is a denial, and there are many of these reply that arrive and they deny absolutely everything, you know, it's always useful to to have that publicly available, yeah. you know, for for your advocacy. Whereas okay. for a for a treaty body to come up with a with a with a, with a, say a ruling or a, a record, yeah determination of the case, it may take quite long. The the what you have in reverse from treaty body is that they make a determination. So they say this was a violation of article so and so of the treaty, and as a result, you know, it there was the government committed torture or the government, uh, uh, you know, arbitrarily detained someone and things like that. You have that determination, which uh, in most cases you don't have by by special procedures. 
Uh, then uh, I take the last question, which is sender is always anonymous. Yes, not for us, but for the for the government. Yes, as I said, we don't disclose the sources. Uh, so so absolutely. But we for us, no, we need to know who the submitter is. And there is a section even the online questionnaire. Uh, the, the, the fourth question is a bit more complex because, yeah, the ex how to manage the expectations. The um, expectation, absolutely, that is super important. Expectation should be managed because, you know, these mechanisms are obviously are uh, in, in, at the international level. They are uh, mostly advocacy based uh, procedures. So, you know, it's not that by uh, by going through these procedures with a letter that is publicly available, there will be immediate changes on the ground, uh, you know, uh, as, you, as you all know better than, uh, than, than me, uh, you know, is a combination of various sections that then eventually lead to a, to a positive outcome. So it's not that uh, will uh, the letter sent to the government on a case will do magic for that case, particularly in relation to changing the actual situation on the ground and the lives of people on the ground, but is another contribution. It, it comes from the international level and that's, as Sagnik mentioned, many states, they don't like uh, to be exposed to international level scrutiny uh, and um, and and that, but it, you know, it, it's it's a contribution that, together with other action that may be taken at the ground level, at the at the national level, etc., may uh, may bring to uh, to a positive solution. So it's important to explain the the, the, the somehow to the victims what are the limits of these procedures? I mean, what could be beneficial eventually, but could, what are are the limits? And we mentioned physical protection is a big limit, and as well as even leading to concrete result is not uh, that automatic. Uh, it, it can, and uh, as Sagnik demonstrated, we are trying to collect all these uh, cases that uh, the, com the, the, the intervention was a special procedure together with other actions led to, to a positive uh, to a positive outcome. I think it's important that you as UNHCR or organization, you also tell you know, these are independent experts and whether they take up a case is at their discretion because they are independent. So, as, as I mentioned, they are even independent of the UN. It doesn't mean that we, we if we say, OK, we received that uh, this submission, uh, it looks like uh, an important case uh, is a complete all sets of information in there, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't mean that the rapporteur so that will necessarily do as we advise, right? So they 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 have the ultimate decision, uh, as I said. So you may also want to explain that to to the to to the victims and. Um, but usually, I think, as Peter mentioned, we 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 can together with uh, you uh, that are advising the the, the 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 victims or the organization on the ground and us, you know, uh, you know, if we get together to find the best, uh, the most effective avenues, the most effective ways. I think in the end, we have the, uh, you know, the we can probably have the rapporteur taking up the case. Uh, That's right. Just to add one point to, uh, on that, uh, Federica, uh, just, uh, the, just going back to the second question on collaboration with other mechanisms, uh, special procedures, uh, I mean, other human rights mechanisms, as, as you mentioned, Federica, is also, there's a bit of strict requirements with treaty bodies and UPR that, that doesn't always fall in line uh, with the flexibility and agility of special procedures. But the special rapporteurs, uh, some in the past have actually collaborated with regional uh, mechanisms like with the African Commission of People and Human Rights and also Inter-American Commission uh, rapporteurs. Uh, at times they have collaborated and have taken up cases. So yeah, there is a kind of possibilities also that has been experimented by by in, in the past by the by the special procedures. Um, yeah, and as you rightly said, comparative advantage definitely, I would say, lies with social procedures because of our low level of admissibility criteria. And definitely we can, uh, we will be much more uh, fast in responding and not at 60 day mark. And even earlier for, for, for the cases where uh, we are discussing about the legislations or policies. 
Well, I think I'll, you know, I'll stop at that. Thank you so much, Federica and Sagnik, for uh, the very clear responses to the questions. Uh, we have another set of four questions, so I will uh, go back to you. Uh, and thanks to all colleagues who are very active uh, in the chat box. So, uh, the first question is, uh, do the special procedures also use tools such as amicus curiae letters? Uh, are they uh, using this opportunity? Well, this is the first question. Uh, the second question is, uh, uh, as you mentioned, why there is no need for exhaustion of domestic remedies if the same case is pending, for instance, uh, at the level of national court, would this bear great weight in determining whether the special procedures would act uh, on a certain case? So this is a second uh, question. And then we have two questions which uh, are uh, related in a way. So, in situations where, um, for example, the state may not have a control of certain territory uh, uh. and the human rights violations happen there, um, how would we address such situation? Would we use special procedures in that case? But also, uh, do the special procedures send communications to non-state actors? So this is the second uh, round of comments and over back to you, Federica and Sagnik, please. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. I mean, uh, very, <laughs> very, um, very good questions. Yes, amicus curiae, yes, special procedures can submit amicus curiae uh, and they do, they've done it and they've uh, increasingly done it. Uh, and. Uh, um, there are a few procedural issues to bear in mind uh, that uh, you know the U, uh, special procedures mandatory that are considered UN experts on mission and as a result they are covered by immunities that by UN immunities so whenever uh, if they they um, decide to intervene in a court cases as amicus uh, they uh, we need to uh, somehow uh, initiate a trigger a procedures with the office of the legal affairs the un office of the legal affairs in relation to the uh, to the um, to their uh, immunities no because uh, you know depending on the jurisdiction uh, you know if uh, there are all sorts of implication if they may be called to court usually they don't but uh, they may be called to courts and other things. So uh, that's all, are all the, the these are mainly procedural aspects that need to be figured out a little bit in advance and things like that. But they can, uh, and uh, and as I said, they do. Obviously, what they would do, I mean, it's much easier that they intervene as a micos brief on the status of international human rights law in that particular case. So they would reinstate what international human rights law. Uh, and standards have said or on on uh, on what is relevant on, on the applicable law in this particular case. They wouldn't really look into the merits of the case exactly. uh, mostly uh, via via the amicus, and uh, um, and also the other things to to bear in mind is also the amicus amicus curiae. Uh, they are useful tool and usually they are also brought, made then they made publicly available once uh, particularly once they uh, they are ready and the court uh, you know the case is uh, more or less finalized or anyway so they can uh, they can be used uh, more widely the only thing is this not really a mandated activity when we say a mandated activity is like there are certain activities that are mandated by the human rights council so they go with the mandate that the council gives to the rapporteurs, you know, and this mandate usually includes the country visit, the thematic reports and the complaint procedures. So the amicus curiae are beyond those mandated activity and as a result there is very limited capacity by certain rapporteurs to do uh, to actually work on uh, on uh, on this uh, on this amicus. So if they when they decide to do so normally they would you know look for partners that can actually help support you know external part and even to OHCHR that can actually help support drafting um, the amicus brief which is obviously requires quite a thorough uh, legal analysis right 
So just for you to bear uh, to bear in mind, but it's possible they've been used and they have been increasingly uh, increasingly used. Um, now the second question: If there is a domestic proceeding going on, would that bear more weight? Um, I'm not so sure. I think that is is a. Uh, I I wouldn't say so. I think it's a strategic uh, decision that the the, the people on the ground, whether it's the victims or the organization or, you know, their council or whatever, they have to uh, to uh, to make if it's strategically, it could be beneficial strategically to have the domestic proceeding at the same time, the the, the um, a procedure at the international level. As I said, from our point of view, it's possible. So it's not that we dismiss a case because there is a domestic proceeding, but whether it's strategically um, it is strategically, um, you know, uh, desirable is something that I think the, the persons that are on the ground, they have to make, because as I said, uh, you know, sometimes special procedures are, or like other international mechanisms are, are used as a bit of a last resource, or almost a last resort when you need to escalate. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, um, the governments, if you send a communication on a case that is going on at the at the um, uh, at the national level, the the government, uh, you know, like they come back and they say, "Sorry, we can't give you any information because this is uh, currently being uh, being uh, looked at by the judiciary. The judiciary is independent, which." We may know that is not the case in a particular country that the judiciary is independent, but, you know, like theoretically the judiciary is independent, so we cannot give you any information and that, you know, come back to us eventually when the when the when the proceeding is over. So, I mean, it really depends. I think it has to be assessed on a case by case basis. Uh, as I said, there are no limitations from our side, but whether it can it can be it can be useful uh, uh, for the domestic uh, uh, proceeding uh, is something that we always, we also count on the sources and the submission the the, the uh, you know the, the the judgment call of the person that submits the information to us and uh, on the on the third question yes yes totally we can send the, the communication can be sent to non state actors have been sent to non state actors this include uh, non state armed uh, groups uh, it includes business i think majority include is businesses um so it, so the special procedures can address all these uh, all these actors. When it comes to businesses, for example, clearly the letter is also sent to the government in uh, to the state, uh, um, because uh, at least when, for example, if I take the business example, obviously the uh, the businesses have a response responsibilities, but the state also keeps its is the primary uh, duty bearer and so has the primary responsibility human rights uh, to, to fulfill the human rights obligation. So we would uh, write to the to the state where the violations occurred. We will write to the business that is maybe involved and to the business we just just don't write to the business in that particular country if the business has an hq somewhere else we also write to that hq and sometimes we write also to the gov to the to the government uh, of the of the state where there is the hq for example so it could be when when we have this type of cases sometimes we have a chain of letters that uh, that covers absolutely uh, everything um on uh, with non state armed groups i mean we have written to them uh it depends also on the on the how do you say on the on the status of the of the contested territories, right? For example, if it's a contested territory, it is depending on the status of how the UN uh, deals with that uh, contested territory. So sometimes we would write to to a state where the contested territory is in, but also to those who have actual effective control of the contested territory. In some cases, not. It depends. Then, it it uh, the, the, the the we need, and then obviously the formulation of what we write is different, you no? Know? Because as I said, you know, businesses do not really have human rights obligations, but they have certainly responsibilities by the UN Guardian principle on business and human rights and other things. You know, similarly with non-state armed groups. Uh, you know, they may not have obligation, but they may have other type of responsibility. So the formulation of the letter may may slightly vary, right? Um, but that and then it remains to be figured out. I actually do you 
make these non-state armed groups, for example, the business, sometimes it's even compli complicated with the business. How do you get this letter to them? You know, sometimes that's, it bogs down to that, really. So sometimes we use, because, you know, usually we have to go through the, um, the diplomatic representation in Geneva when we send this letter. So clearly this uh, no state groups or, you know, well, the business, we send them wherever we find, uh, you know, an email address or anything. But for the no state um, groups, sometimes it really bogs down. How do we get the, the letter to them? Um, because clearly they don't have a diplomatic representation. Sometimes people working on the ground, they are they they cannot have official uh, communication with the you non-state know, armed groups. So I mean, but on that we can do it. We work a lot with other OSHR offices on the ground or other UN offices on the ground to figure uh, to uh, to figure that out. Now I'm not sure if Sagnik has any information whether we have ever received any. <laughs> A response or any reaction when we were writing to non-state actors. I mean, business, yes, business. They take when you when they receive one of our communication, they are they take it very seriously and they mobilize all their lawyers to send us, uh, you know, very thorough reply and things like that. And sometimes they even uh, threatened uh, legal action, uh, you know. So they take it very seriously. <laughs> they are very reactive, yes. uh, etc. In relation to non-state armed groups, I'm not so sure uh, what the, the response or rate or if there was a reaction that was not an official reaction. I, that one, I, I don't have the, uh, this information. I mean, lately, we have not sent any such letter to a non-state actor in that sense, our armed group in that sense. Uh, and I'm trying to recall quickly, but I can't remember if we have received anything from any reply as such, any kind of official reply. Because of, we often, as Federica said, we, we deliver those letters through our field presences, through uh, any UN field presences uh, on the ground that can deliver them letters. Usually, there is an acknowledgement of such a receipt, definitely, but uh, I, have, I don't remember having received a kind of response to that, to that communication. Uh, I just saw one uh, um, question also that, do we write also to the UN? And in fact, rapporteurs have written to the Secretary General also, to the World Bank, to the IMF, to all kinds of UN agencies. So they are really independent in that sense. So whoever may be in their in their uh, in their how to say view as a as a as a cause of a violation or is is perpetrating a kind of situation that leads to a violation. Definitely, whether it's an UN agency or even the Secretary General himself, they are they are not uh, they can't escape. Uh, they will receive a communication. Yeah. Thank you so much, Federica and Sagnik. Uh, this has been very, very useful. Uh, and all the questions, of course, uh, super relevant. I would maybe like to come back uh, for a second to Peter to uh, give another example on the domestic remedies that uh, that was asked uh, to respond to, uh, from, from that angle. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Valerie. And no, thanks for the question on that. And uh, just as you were speaking, Federica, it uh, reminded me of this this other case to share an example. Why, uh, particularly from UNHCR's perspective, sometimes it's important actually to to launch these communications while there's an ongoing domestic remedy, particularly if we have an individual we suspect is facing a risk of deportation or reform. Um, that's where we sometimes need to get in ahead and, and have the communication brought to the attention of special rapporteurs or independent experts. That that pressure to the situation, uh, positive pressure bringing to light the situation of the individual and the, the potential violation they could face if returned. Uh, so for us, just to, we have a recent example where we've worked with a number of mandate holders who have sent a communication to a government on the case of an asylum seeker where the UNHCR suspects and based on past practice, we we assume that the, the asylum claim may be denied even though we feel the individual might be at risk of, of human rights violations if returned. So in that case, uh, I think there was a, an example of where we might want to go ahead even though there's a domestic procedure going on, even though it could pos possibly uh, turn out positively for the individual, we might want to to bring in this other angle if we think strategic in the particular case. Uh, so thanks for, for, for giving me back another minute to, to put that example forward. Thanks, Valerie. 
Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing this example. And uh, um, before we come to the closing, we have received one last question that I would like to return to Sagnik and Federica, uh, which is focusing on um, I will just read it because it has been just received. Uh, um, I would like to ask for the mechanism at the disposal of the special rapporteurs and special procedures on the implementation of the communication of the special rapporteurs on individual cases, particularly where the states choose not to respond to the communication or response in a manner with, without addressing the issue. So how we can follow up in case there is no no response from the state? Uh, what are the different mechanisms? Over to you. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, thanks for the question. Well, yes, in a way, um, one way to follow up uh, would be uh, to work together with other mechanism. This one we mentioned uh, a little earlier, uh, you know, particularly treaty bodies, uh, um, uh, if it's an individual case, I guess a bit less with UPR because they they don't really take up uh, those cases. But uh, so that is a way to follow up. The other way is the special rapporteur, you know, the, the dialogue to this exchange of letters continues. So obviously the states respond and denies uh, the violations or, you know, because every communication, every letter has a set of questions and usually they come back with all sorts of things without responding to the questions. So, you know, that's very, very common. Uh, so in that case, the special rapporteur can continue, you know, can continue the, the the engagement and the live via letter saying thank you very much, but uh, you know these uh, uh, these points have not been addressed or. Uh, no, I, I received, I keep receiving information uh, that, you know, the, the, the case is still ongoing and it's not getting better and uh, actually is worsening or things like that. So, and that's why it's important also that the source of the first, the, the source of the first submission also keeps us informed of follow up information on that particular particularly if uh, because it's useful for us particularly if we need to do the follow-up now clearly given limited resources given the global mandate of the special rapporteur etc is very uh, you know like this follow-up cannot be done on a is not done on a systematic basis right because uh, because it's uh, you know it's not possible just not possible but if we have the source that keeps sending follow-up information and the situation is actually worsening, etc. You know, and there are clear signs. I think these are cases that, uh, you know, the special rapporteur should and have been following up, uh, you know, and, you know, at most, then the special rapporteur can also decide to to issue a public uh, a press release. Exactly. Now, this we, we haven't mentioned this because, you know, it goes a little the, the communication procedures, but you know, we have had cases where, you know, many communication were sent and no replies from the government or replies that were not satisfactory. And as a result, and despite even communications and the replies being public, you know, the special rapporteur decided to, to issue a press release uh, that, you know, is picked up by the media and then create a bit of, uh, you know, uh, additional mobilization around the case. So these are all tools that are available uh, to the special rapporteurs, but as I said, uh, you know, it's important to count on the continued cooperation of the source, sending information, telling us how the situation is going on the ground, and also, you know, suggesting additional ways to uh, to to do the follow up, or you know, additional way that the special rapporteur uh, can intervene. As you know, uh, these mechanisms are not, they don't have attached uh, enforcement uh, enforcement uh, uh, means, so that's a little bit the weakness of the mechanism, but uh, there are ways to, to follow up. Although, as I said, given limited resources and global mandate, it cannot be done systematically on every single case. It is not done systematically on every single case. And Thank you. Also, also, just to add here, I mean, uh, often mandate holders I mean, these kinds of cases that keep, you know, are, are getting emblematic with no kind of actual response from governments. When any other mandate holder, by chance, if it, if they go on a country visit to that to that country or into that area 
or to, to, to meet that uh, officials, you know, to the permanent missions, they do raise these issues. They do raise these cases. I mean, if, even if it may not be directly related to them, to their mandate, they may raise these cases with the highest authorities in the, in the land and say that, listen, uh, uh, this is, by the way, this is also something that is lying pending uh, from a communication that has not been responded, you know, that kind of, uh, how to say, uh, kind of dialogue also happen if, if and when there is a country visit uh, to, to that country. In fact, um, I mean, uh, often for such things which did it open for other mandate holders, but but um, uh, had a center visit request or invite to a particular mandate, and the mandate visited the country, he, the mandate holder has in the past raised, you know, the, these pending issues with the highest authorities, asking for also a kind of response in 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 in, in those pending cases. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Federica and Sagnik, uh, uh, for responding to all questions. Actually, we have received very rich questions. Yes, well done. And uh, of course, uh, colleagues uh, on the call, uh, we can continue this exchange and dialogue uh, beyond this uh, webinar, and we would be happy uh, to facilitate the contact with Federica and Sagnik or uh, provide uh, assistance guidance as useful and as needed. So please take this uh, event of a potential dialogue or engagement where you feel relevant, even if you are not sure if a case is uh, strategically, um, you know, fit uh, to bring it to the special procedures, we can discuss, we can, uh, we can have a discussion around that and uh, uh, provide more guidance uh, and link up with Sagnik and Federica. So don't hesitate to be in touch. And before we close, I would also like to say that uh, uh, we are keen to um, do other thematic webinars. Uh, on 10th of uh, December, as you may know, we have a webinar with other OHCHR colleagues, how to strengthen collaboration for UNHCR colleagues, but we will do other uh, events for the task team. And if you have any suggestions uh, of themes that you would be interested in, particular targeted topics such as the individual complaints um, procedures, then we would be happy to take it on board. So again, thank you very much. Thanks to Federica and Sagnik. Uh, uh, and uh, we look forward to being in touch with all of you. And on behalf of the TAS team, also Isaiah and Elisa, uh, who are uh, at the background, make everything is going smoothly. Thank you very much and wishing you a good afternoon or evening. Goodbye. Thank you, and thank you to the whole TAS team for getting these uh, things going. is uh, is really I think is very is very useful for us too, and uh, and hope we can continue the discussion. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. I I think I fully agree with what Federica <laughs> said. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you very much. And of course, we will be sending the materials. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thanks.